this um, this morning we've got a really interesting panel to talk to um, about home learning, um, bearing in mind that this is a very diverse panel, a group of people who through you know, different ways. I've got to know them through my own journey through homeschooling. And it includes people who have not initially chosen homeschooling or who right now are homeschooling through the pandemic. So, you know, people from all different um, perspectives. And um, we just thought it would be interesting to get everyone together to have a discussion about what home learning is really like. We have Sean McDougall, trustee for the Centre of Personalised Education, home educator and future education consultant. We have Ninadwa Mbucha, a Christian home educating mum of four, radio producer and co-host of Black Mums Upfront podcast. We have Wendy Charles Warner, home education campaigner and a trustee of the Centre for Personalised Education as well, and also education otherwise. We have Eloise Rickman, author of the book Extraordinary Parenting, parent educator and the founder of a Childhood. And we have Damien Gale, a Guardian reporter and an advocate of alternative education. And Damien is our is our novelty person who, like anyone else who's listening to this, um, through yet another um, school closure. Okay, um, so I just wanted to get the ball rolling. Uh, because we're trying a new way of home, home educating, which is doing it with both parents, which we had never done before. So I am trying not to micromanage my husband <laughs> every move so that he doesn't destroy everything that I have built up in my kids over the past few years. I'm trying my best to just, just let him find his feet, but, but helpfully um, assist um, so it's been a really interesting week, but a great one at that as we are uh, juggling a new way of life. Yes, yeah, so many people juggling a new way of life. Um, how, how have other people's weeks been? Uh, Eloise, I know you have a little one as well. Um, ha, ha, have you been finding things particularly different during pandemic homeschooling compared to regular homeschooling? I, mean, I think we're all getting a bit bored, to be <laughs> honest. So I think yeah. it's fine enough, and I felt quite sad, but so much of this year of her life, she'll be six in April, will have, mm. you know, she doesn't have any siblings. So it'll just have been her, me and her dad. And that feels, I think, you know, we're, we're starting to feel that rubbing up again. Absolutely. Yeah. But the only people we see are each other and <laughs> these four walls. Um, but apart from that, we're just taking it really slow after a bit of a kind of break over Christmas of doing anything sort of planned out. Um, yeah. We're kind of, into our, our rhythm I call it so um, focusing on a bit of kind of learning time together in the morning which is a bit more focused um, getting some proper kind of quiet time in after lunch which is really important for me so that I get yeah. a bit of myself um, yeah. kind of gathering back again together later in the afternoon um, and just trying to get back into the flow of things but apart from that we're doing lots of just free play um, lots of kind of interest-led learning reading lots about dinosaurs at the moment it's been yeah really <laughs> and I know I know you know Damien I was saying that you're you're the only person on this panel whose children you know do attend a school setting um although I know it's not a mainstream school setting but nonetheless lockdowns and school closures must affect your routine um how have you coped with these stretches of home learning um over the past year well, um, this week's been it's been pretty calm actually. Um, my son has been um, my son's been remote learning, which is means effectively that I sit in the front room on my laptop doing my work, um, and he's sitting on the other side of the front room on another laptop <laughs> linked up to his classroom via Google Google Meet, um, which is kind of weird, and it's not really how I imagined that it would pan out. I, I was hoping that I'd be able to be a bit more hands-on like I was um, with my children during the last lockdown, um, where effectively I was I was taking charge of their of their education and the mm. providing exercises for them to do, but I was able to supplement that with the things that I wanted them to learn or that I you know we were able to take things at our own pace a little bit more and um now it's like he's he's plugged into this glowing screen this shimmering screen all day long and and he seems to enjoy it though which is which is cool and his, and his teacher is is doing really a really great job but um it's not quite panning out how how I imagined it might 
Mm, mm. Actually, um, I I'll just take a slight detour there and just check in with with Sean because you you have slightly older children, um, you know, like Damien um, has. You know, do, do, does your I think it's your daughter? Does she do much online? Is that a sort of choice that she makes, or or how does it flow for you guys? Yeah, it's really interesting. My, my daughter is eleven, so she would be in the final year of primary school um, mm. at, at this time. Um, and what Damien just said there about, you know, coming back into a second lockdown, but this time teachers are playing so much more of an active role in um, providing instruction over the ether, you know, to um, keeping children occupied that way. Well, I read yesterday 70% of teachers are using Microsoft Teams um, to provide lessons in this lockdown, but only 10% of them consider it to be satisfactory. And uh, it's quite a strange experience, I imagine, for a lot of kids. Now, for for somebody like my daughter who's never been to school, uh, she has evolved for herself a um, a balance during the day of time that she spends online, time that she spends uh, just chatting with us or or doing what, what she likes. Um, oh. But she found it she's found it really hard this time for because I think with during the uh, Christmas New Year period there was that window of opportunity she was able to see her uh, nanny for the first time in seven months and then she's had to go back into a routine of not being able to see her, her friends apart from apart from say gaming with them online so mm. um but one one thing I wanted to throw into the mix is uh, what that's led me to see is that uh, children in home education because they have they have a more defined sense of, the, of themselves in the home and they have a, a kind of relationship with their parents which can often be much more equal um, in terms of how they see their place within the home and and therefore i think they've had perhaps a, a greater ability to cope with being at home but because of that christmas new year break uh, she's she's feeling something now that I think children who go to school maybe felt perhaps after two or three months of the first lockdown. Uh, she's made it through about uh, seven or eight months, but now is beginning to feel that same way. And we've had to adapt our practice to take account of that. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I'm just I'm just going to. Um pick up on something that both you and Eloise have have said here and um, can I just remind the the group um, questions put them on the chat um, because we're going to take questions at the end through Katie thank you so much um, I'm going to pick on something that you and Eloise have both touched on I think it's relevant to the whole panel and to anyone who is home educating or you know homeschooling through a uh, school closures which is socialization you know this was uh, this is something that is so important to all our children naturally important and it is very um, difficult to do during this pandemic. Obviously, anyone who's homeschooling through the lockdown has the impression that it's a very isolating experience, which it isn't. It, it's, it's isolating for us now because of the virus, but actually it's normally highly social. Um, you know, who, who has found a, a good way or experimented with ways of trying to help their children have some connection with their friends, with their family during this time? If I could just come back, I'll give you an example yeah. that I saw uh, during during the first lockdown um, as my daughter was adjusting to um, a world of being in touch with friends online but not seeing them physically. And, and yeah. what she started doing was um, creating uh, stop motion videos of, uh, she, would find, she would find songs that they all liked and she made videos to them. But in the video, she recreated scenes that they had all been to at together an event they had all been at and the oh. stars of the video were her friends and then she shared them with with the other friends and um it was a way of her showing other people how much she values that that physical um presence um and so so i was really impressed with her obviously uh, for doing that but these days generally speaking first thing in the morning she gets uh, she gets up she goes online she has about 90 minutes of gaming time with uh, one or another mm. of her two best friends and, mm. and then moves on to something else yeah yeah do yours Damien find a a, a similar way to connect because obviously Nadja and I our kids are our kids are friends they're similar age to Eloise's kids we try to do things like um zoom chats with them and honestly it doesn't work does it really it is it's not easy at all um I don't know is it different for older children 
Well, actually, my, my, my children are, are nine and seven, so they're quite similar in age. And actually, they can hang out together and have quite a good time together, which is which is a relief for, for mm, mm, mm. Given um, the Steiner kind of injunction against um, screens, I was a bit naughty, actually. I bought my daughter an iPod for Christmas. Um, so now she can do FaceTime mm. with her cousin and with her friends. Um, and during the first lockdown, my son was actually through through his mother's phone. He was doing video chats with with a friend of his, and they what they would just do is they'd have the video on, and they'd just be playing Lego. And, and my son would be playing Lego in his bedroom. His best friend would be playing Lego at home, and they wouldn't even almost almost wouldn't even be talking, mm-hmm. you know. But they'd be playing there with their Lego sets and just being in each other's presence in that way. Mm, mm. to make a difference you know it seemed to to um, maintain that connection which um which they have as friends i mean obviously it's it's by no means ideal it's not what you really want i don't really like having my children in front of the screen um at all not even to watch a ninjago or anything like that but mm. um, but you know you have to do what you can uh, you make such a valid point there, don't you, about children wanting to just be alongside each other, play alongside each other, and finding ways to still allow that to happen. Um, it's 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 difficult, but that's that's a really really valid point. And then, Adra, I'm just going to come over to you because you you have quite a big family. You have four children, um, and people are constantly asking, you know, on the radio and in call-ins, how do I juggle different needs? You know, a really wide spectrum of different needs. And I think that when you have younger children you know you have a a baby um right the way up to to a seven-year-old and I think that young age group you know the incremental changes are so fast you are dealing with very different needs how you know do you have any tips for juggling things uh as you know Anna my (laughs) my tip is just let life happen (laughs) um with the yeah (laughs) and I don't and don't stress too much about it with the younger kids um they learn from from the older kids. I mean, I remember my eldest, who's nearly seven, when she was young, I took her along to all the baby groups and all, I did, I don't know, baby massage and all kinds, all those things you do when you got your first child. Yeah. Then the second came along, he maybe went along to a few things. By the third, nah, it was just learning from whatever they did. And yeah. so I guess I'm blessed in the sense that I do have a larger family and I really don't worry about what the younger ones are learning so much yeah. because they soak it up. I mean, my five, is he five? Yeah, my five-year-old, um, maybe like a year ago, I had never taught him the alphabet or how to read or anything like that. And one day I thought, oh gosh, I, I need to maybe start thinking about reading with him, but I haven't even taught him the alphabet yet. Little did I know he knew it. Yeah. I don't I didn't teach him he has just seen his older sibling doing it he's seen things around the house and so the three-year-old now he's kind of gaining an interest in wanting to understand the letters and shapes and all this kind of stuff and again I'm I mean I kind of teach him a little bit but really he's not my priority in the kind of um, focused learning at the moment mm-hmm. he can just go and play and play is amazing for him so for me, I don't worry about whether the younger ones are getting that much um, intentional input mm. because I see that just being in the home with us is huge value for them. And as they get a little bit older, towards six, seven, um, then I'll probably start focusing and giving them more attention as well. I don't kind of just let them run wild. They do try, but um, I'm not worried about what it is that they're learning at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, um, I, I feel the same way with my kids. And that's something I would never have believed previously. You know, my kids did attend school and I, you know, have a background in teaching. I really didn't think children could learn that way. I didn't think they couldn't. I just didn't know they could. So what you say there is something that you, you have to let it happen to see it happen. Absolutely. Um, Wendy, I'm going to come over to you uh, because, you know, I... You have such a huge uh, history and experience in in home education and in home educating your own daughter and your grandson and and more. In fact, um, I just wanted to sort of touch base with you about what what do you think is um, so important about the right to protect um, uh, home education and protecting that right for parents. Parent, parents parents always from the outset 
are trying to do their best for their children. And parents recognise that school is not necessarily the best thing for their children. And they have choices. When your child's when your child's tiny, you can choose whether to employ a nanny or whether to send them to nursery. When your child gets to five, you can choose whether to send them to Montessori, to um, a, a Waldorf Steiner, send them to school, or just simply carry on home educating them. And it's really important that par- we we recognise that it's parents who know their child best. The parent knows what is best for their child, and at, at five years old. Some children are still babies, effectively. Others are raring to go out into the world and desperate to go into a group situation. And a child like that will really benefit, possibly, from a form of school where they're in a group situation. A child who isn't um, raring to go out into the world and, and still needs the very close nurturing of family won't. And there are... Even, there are also lifestyle choices that parents have the right to make. The, the, the choice to spend more family time, the choice to travel, the choice to recognise that the national curriculum, in your view, may not be fit for purpose and to provide something you think is better. The choice to not put your child into a situation where you know, for example, um, bullying can be rife. We know from research that the UK teenagers are the unhappiest some of the unhappiest in the world and a lot of this is to do with peer pressure and the things happening at school Mm. parents need to have that choice it's really important it's not about uh, home education is always better than school or (laughs) educators do not uh, approve of school it's about choice parents deserve and should retain choice yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, let's just stick with this theme of, you know, of, of home education, why people home educate. Um, uh, Eloise, you, you studied anthropology at university, I believe, and you now home educate your, your daughter. And I wondered whether, you know, what, what your kind of, um, you know, your, your basis was for choosing home education from the start uh, with your child, as opposed to realizing the, the problems that, you know, can exist within the school system? I think it was twofold. Um, So I was home educated myself until I was six. So Mm. I went into school in um, year two. Mm. And my mother would have liked to continue home educating me, but my parents just simply needed two incomes at that point and it wasn't possible. Um, So I think I already had that sense of, wow, home education is a good thing. I feel that it really served me well and gave me a really good sort of solid start to the rest of my life. But then yeah. I, and I've, I think I've maybe talked to you about this before, the fact that studying something like anthropology, where you are learning all about how all different sort of cultures and communities all over the world are raising children and how they structure um, their kind of familial relationships. Mm. I think a lot of confidence to go, oh, OK, maybe there isn't just one way of doing things. I think sometimes yeah. it's kind of colonial attitude to think there is one right way to educate children and it's written down here and we can all go and do it and I think yeah yeah a lot of sort of reassurance it almost gave me permission to go hey children are thriving all over the world in all different types of communities and all different types of settings Mm. um kind of follow on from what Wendy was saying as well about it being a you know the choice of the parents Mm. I think for me really important as um not just a sort of choice for the parents but also a choice for the child and honoring really that child's sort of rights and needs and freedoms um so yeah it was definitely a permission giving subject to study Mm, mm, mm. so I mean Wendy I know I know you've you've got you know you've looked into this haven't you I think you might have even done some writing on looking at what what the uh this kind of colonial perspective this one-way perspective of of school being the right way you've made it clear that school is is suitable for some children or school is simply the right choice for some families but um do you want to build a little bit on what Eloise said there yes it's actually Eloise brings up a really good point we have this primacy of the colonial attitude of of we have schools we have a set curriculum which is a very developed country curriculum and that should be forced onto all families whereas in fact we have an awful lot to learn from indigenous peoples we we can look at the systems how families learn 
all over the world from um, groups of peoples that we don't necessarily look to as the, the developed world. We do not look to these people naturally, and we ought to be doing so because mm. they have so much we can learn from them. And this is coming through at very advanced levels. Um, even uh, the understanding of environmental protection, for example, we're now looking to the indigenous peoples to teach us as members of the developed world how to protect our environment education is the same we have a lot to learn from indigenous peoples we we cannot just take this colonial attitude and home education recognizes that i think for a lot mm. of families mm. and i'm i'm thinking when you when you say that about uh, the point nanajo was making about her children just just learning just absorbing from what's going around them actually that is the natural way for all of us to learn and in fact in our adult life that is how most of us learn um and and it it makes me think of a, of a wonderful conversation i had with with sean just before we before we we did the zoom um i wanted to get to know uh, sean a little better and um and i and we were talking about you know homeschool fails and things and uh and sean said had said to me uh, well do you want to tell the story sean because you were saying that your your biggest fail was on your first day of home education Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, all, the, the first day of um, when, when my daughter would have gone to school, but didn't. And so she went into home education. And even though it was exactly the same as yesterday, it felt momentously different for us. And, and we felt this overwhelming pressure to embark on something rather than just continue as, as we were. So, so we went off for a nature walk. We we're walking around this beautiful wood and just standing in the stream and you know playing with pebbles and and um find myself trying to point out shapes in the tree that resemble letters of the alphabet and trying trying to impose this additional learning on her an academic structured environment in the middle of woodland and you know it was purely because we would have felt terribly disappointed that we hadn't achieved anything whereas children at school were getting ahead <laughs> and you know and, and it took us a while to um to realize that, that that we were standing in the middle of a really fantastic learning environment we didn't need to provide anything else and um in time she began to express an interest in the alphabet and reading and yeah. she picked it up really fast at that point so you know why why ruin a really good trip around a wood and how would you describe your your home educating style now? Because what Damien describes um, shut down schooling like actually uh, lots of home educators, you know, educate that way as well. Um, so so there is there's such a spectrum. None of us represent what home education is. There's such a spectrum, isn't there? So just to get give everyone a flavor of what it can be like, what's your style? What happens in your house? Well, well, for for us, I think most people looking at us would consider us to be quite unstructured um, or ver verging towards what's called unschooling. I don't like mm. that term because it sounds oppositional to schooling, but it's it's not. Um, what what happens with us, for instance, is that my daughter mm. gets up in the morning. She has uh, some time every every morning with mm. with friends gaming. She likes to feel that she's got. You know some social contacts straight away okay. and then um at about 11 o'clock uh she'll she'll start doing something else and that might be for instance um watching a documentary reading book music lesson um we go out for walks we um i take great pleasure in what we call our philosophy walks um we go for we go for a walk and we pick a topic and and we just talk about it in depth but you know, mm. philosophy is the thing that's really missing, I believe, from the school curriculum. Yeah. And it does so much to explain how we've ended up with, with Brexit and Trump and, and people totally at odds with each other because they can't reason and understand other points of view properly. Yeah. So so that's a big thing. And, uh, and the most recent development um, is that she has begun to express an interest in academic uh, topics. And um, as she said, um could could we take it in turns doing presentations but we would each give the other person the topic to be covered so my wife gave her the topic of hexagons just to make sure that she was you know looking at angles and things and she started talking about the giant's causeway and explaining how all the all the angles add up to something or other i don't know myself but uh, um but anyway she then gave a topic back to my wife and so she said i want you to tell me the history of the video game among us and 
which my, my wife had never even heard of. <laughs> and, uh, but she had to go off and research and present on, yeah. on that. And, and she found out all sorts of really interesting things about software programmers cycling to and from work and mm. how the animations and things worked. And so, and they've started to build a relationship and they've both started to learn how to use PowerPoint for really, you know, my, my daughter's much better, <laughs> I have to say, but um, they're, they're, they're doing amazing, things which give you you know presentational skills research skills using your computer being persuasive all that stuff uh, and we just let it go because we see at the end of any year she's added up at least as much knowledge as she would have gotten in a school environment and it doesn't matter that it mm. didn't come in any particular order um it, it's it's all perfectly valid and she's doing she's doing fine and I think you've 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 created such a such a lovely picture there of something that I feel is so true to homeschooling, um, home education. This idea of it just naturally inspires you as a parent to be a better version of yourself. That's not to put down uh, parents whose children go to school who are all doing a fantastic job. It's simply that you go, you start learning again yourself. You kind of naturally you can't help it. There's no other way to do it. You you go back to back to the learning uh, to, to to learning yourself, and it's it's um it's a really enriching experience for the whole family. And I, I really like the way you put it there. Um, Nanajua, just looping back to you, your 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 former pod, podcast, Dope Black Mums, and your current podcast, Black Mums Up Front, is um, you know, you you have this really strong focus on honesty and identity. You're all really different women, and you have different perspectives on how you raise your kids, and you kind of wrestle it out, <laughs> and I love that. Um, and I just wondered whether for you, home education is is part of that, is part of that um identity for you or even sense of being able to give your children the identity you know that kind of sense of who they are is that is that part of your decision to home educate or did it just happen organically so when I decided to home educate I really didn't know why I was going to do it but it just seemed like a nice idea I mean I wrestled yeah. with it for a few years but when I started there was no real conviction that this is what I must do mm. but as I have been doing it I've realized more and more why it is important for me to do this for my children. Now, my children being black children of African descent, whether people want to believe it or not, they are going to get stereotyped and prejudice against them when they go to school. I, I know it. I've heard it. I've seen it in other settings as well. So if I can nurture my children children at home give them the right foundation so that they so that they are so secure in who they are so that by the time that they do decide to go to school if they want to or go out into the workplace or go to ballet class or whatever it is they know who they are and no one else not the system the government a teacher can try to beat them down because sadly that is what they try to do to black children they excel quite nicely when they go into primary school by the end of primary school and as they go into secondary school it's a whole other thing especially for black boys and I've got three black boys so for me finding my own ad identity as a black woman and also um showing my children that they should be proud of who they are, what they look like, their heritage, their hair, their skin tone, all those things I can do while they're at home. I'm not saying that I'm shoving it in their, in their throats all the time and in their face and everything, not at all. Um, but they are just gaining the value of their family by being within our four walls. Um, and I know now that when they step out, they are that little bit more confident about who they are. So for me, um, whilst I love home education for a variety of reasons, um, that is something that's really, really important to me. Yeah, and Nanajo, you know, we've spoken about this before. What, what I find really worrying, really upsetting is um, that, you know, what I feel, I hear, the narrative that I, I hear a lot in, in the sort of, on the radio, in the media, is this thing of home education kind of is okay for a couple of middle-class hippies, but if a lot of people are gonna start taking their kids out of school, that's not okay. It's not for you. 
it's not going to become a mainstream thing. And for me, this damages the, the people and the communities that in some respects could the most benefit from home education and for whom school serves the least. Your point, Wendy, you obviously talk to people um, from all walks of life about exactly these issues uh, because of your role with education otherwise. Um, what do you find to be the reason for this quite dramatic rise in elective home education registrations since the pandemic began? I've, I've been doing tranches of research throughout the period and I was expecting to see a large rise in people who were home educating because they were concerned about COVID-19. They were concerned about exposure to um, the, the, the virus in a school situation. But that's not been the case. My very first uh, tranche of, of questionnaires came back with a lot of people who said they were home educating for COVID-19 reasons. And I, from then onwards, I broke it down and asked, what are these reasons? And more than 70% more than of them were saying, well, actually, educating my children at home gave me an opportunity to realise how much it benefited them. I heard comments like, my child's come on leaps and bounds, and more tellingly, I've got my child back. And people are actually feeling as if they've, they've learned something from the experience, and it, it's, it's benefited them. Although it's a horrible experience for everyone, it's benefited them. Mm, 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 absolutely and this this is this is something that is um such a common experience and yet doesn't seem to be be coming through in an obvious way as the reason it, it seems to continue to be this narrative around fear around the vaccine with uh, uh, fear around the virus which in fact it isn't um sean you know your your company stakeholder design deals with uh systemic inequalities at Actually, rather fascinatingly, um, I recommend anyone who's interested in this uh, across the board to, to check out Sean's website, maybe even contact Sean personally, because it was mind blowing. I was mind blown in a, a 15 minute conversation was enough. <laughs> I don't think I'm quite smart enough for this, but nonetheless, fascinating. And obviously, one of the one of the focuses, just one is education. Um, can you can you build a little on what Nanajua has pointed out as a very valid reason for her keeping her children at home, at least at this time, that Wendy's found th uh, through speaking with families who are withdrawing their children. What were your findings about inequalities in the education system? Yeah, it's uh, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I must just take my uh, hat off to uh, Nana. You, you know, you're doing something which so many people have done, which is decide to put their children first and to f find yourself feeling like you're taking on the state by doing that is it's a horrible feeling. And I, you know, I salute so many home educators feel that they, they have to be brave uh, to do something which is actually entirely natural. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the what, what Nana is saying is if, if you actually uh, did well enough in school as a black boy and you decided to become um, a teacher yourself you know at every single stage you're less likely to be admitted to teacher training college if you do become a teacher you're twice as likely to be charged with a misdemeanor and um, if you get charged with exactly the same misdemeanor as a white teacher you're twice as likely to be um, um, sacked for the uh, as a consequence than, than the white teacher there if I, I did a piece of work uh, for Croydon local authority and uh, you know the population uh, spread in, in in Croydon is is one where it's very quite quite heavily um, you know white the white community is probably thirty percent I think it's uh, a while back now and yet oh. there were something like nineteen secondary schools in the borough and and eighteen of them had a white head teacher so you know it's it's completely natural and predictable in a in a situation like that that that. The experience of being a black boy is one where there are no mentors. Um, the the messages given to you are basically about how white people have done quite well, <laughs> and uh, oh, you know that oh. there's no way in for somebody like you. But you know you might have a secondary role if you're lucky, right? And that um, even plays out when I, I take people on study tours uh, uh, from time to time, and mm. um, mostly people want to go to a country that Britain conquered at some point in the past. <laughs> And uh, and what they see when they get there is a British system created in the in its image, and um, so I take them to somewhere like Denmark instead, where the, where they can see a country that 
you know, they don't speak English. They don't have a, a history of conquering other countries. They, they're, um, they trade on their intellect and, mm. and they produce some wonderfully well-rounded, highly imaginative people, very well suited mm. to the 21st century. Mm -mm. And, so, so really the message here is, is that education is a service on offer to the community. It is yeah. one which you can access um, in the form of state provision or public schools or private tuition, or you can choose to do it yourself. And whichever route you go down, you may have a good or a bad experience from it. And um, one of the things that, that I do in my career is when people are having a bad experience, when they find the system is rigged against them, I then look at the system itself and try to help them to redesign that system so that it becomes more accessible and more inclusive so that more people can actually succeed. Mm. Um, just building on that, Damien, um, you, you know, your children don't attend a main, a mainstream school setting, but through your work, um, through your journalism, do you feel that these concerns that are being raised in this discussion today about equality in education and about representation of minorities in education. I know I worked in a school that was, uh, I think it was over 60%, over 70%, exactly the location Sean's talking about, non-white, yet the majority of teachers and certainly all of management were white British. And 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 so I went to Farrell Sean say about that reputation. Are these common concerns emerging um, you know, in news stories amongst the public in general? Um, or, or are they or are they really within the home teaching community that this knowledge is dead? Um, I don't know if Damon is still there. Let me just check a break. Oh no, Damon's there. Hi. Yeah, no, well, I mean, obviously after um last May and the demonstrations that, that began with Black Lives Matter, the, an awareness of this has, has spread across all, all sectors of, of the UK and particularly in the media. Um, like my editors at the newspaper are much more aware in covering these kinds of stories now. I mean, we've had decolonized the curriculum campaigns for a long time in universities. We've had the whole Roads Must Fall campaign calling for um, for, for the statue of Cecil Rhodes at Oxford University to be taken down, for instance. Uh, and I think that these are now gradually um, moving, sort of percolating down through the educational um, uh, system, as it were. So um, I, I think it's only recently that the government refused to um, take steps to diversify um, the secondary school curriculum in, in subjects like uh, English literature. Um, to, to, to cover those. So I do think yeah, it is a problem. It is a problem for children who are coming from different backgrounds. Um, I mean, my children um, are half Latino, I'm mixed race. So, you know, we don't see a lot of reflection of ourselves in the mainstream educational system. I mean, this, this problem's actually exacerbated if you choose uh, an alternative form of education like Steiner education, which is very heavily kind of biased towards, um, you know, a kind of central European um, conception of, of what it means to be human. And, and we all know, and it's famously spoken about Rudolf Steiner's funny ideas about race. Um, now, I mean, that's not reflected in, in the way that my um, children's teachers behave towards them, but obviously that's a part of the system which, which they're involved in. And, um, and as a parent, you know, I believe it's, it's my responsibility to educate them, to be, uh, to understand their, their, their heritage and where they come from ethnically and, and culturally. So, so yeah, I mean, obviously it's, it's a big problem, you know, it's a big problem right across the spectrum, right across the board in education. Um, and uh, hopefully people are, are beginning to find some answers, but I, I mean, I've always been, even though my children go to a school, I've always believed that actually, you know, the, the ultimate responsibility for education rests with the parent. So as a parent, it's up to me to make sure that my children are getting the education. If they're being told the wrong things at school, it's up to me to, to tell them actually, well, that's not right. You can go back and challenge your teacher over that, or you don't need to listen to that particular lesson from your teacher. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, I think I think that this that, that this is so crucial, isn't it? That the diversification of just of our of our population of what it is to be to be human. Uh, the more that children are in the family, and the more that children are raised, you know, in a family that has a strong sense of who they are and of what their belief systems are, you know, the more we raise a, a diverse population. Um, and the, uh, who, who, you know, without the kind of um, both homogenizing but also polarizing nature of the school system of, of sticking everyone together and attempting to put everyone through the same the same route, it both homogenizes but it also polarizes, doesn't it? Whereas in 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 a way, by allowing children to even just spend more time in the family, like in standard education, start age seven rather than age four, you know, to give children more time, like Eloise was saying in her childhood, to establish that sense of who they are before they go out into the world has to be a healthy thing. Eloise, you run a course um, helping people to, to prepare to home educate or to consider home education. And uh, obviously, you know, we've been coming across lots of reasons to home educate or to not participate in mainstream schooling if it doesn't feel right for your family. Um, but do you do you find that parents sometimes have some concerns about home education, some reasons why they think oh, maybe it wouldn't work for me, maybe it wouldn't work for us? Yeah, I think there are a few kind of recurring themes which tend to come up. I think the mm. first one, um, which I see so much, is just simply, I would love to home educate, but my partner is not on board, which is a really, really common one. Um, mm. I also hear a lot from families who, um, and kind of linked to that as well, I think there's often a lot of sort of peer pressure or pressure from family members. Um, so I think that whole sense of being sort of isolated and alone in the decision and having to fight constantly is, is quite a big one. And I think probably one of the main ones. Um, I think also just a sense of how do I make this work? And, you know, most people I think nowadays need to have two incomes coming in or to sort of radically change their lifestyles. Um, mm. That sense of, I, I would love to be able to do this for my child, but how do I make it work in kind of, and I, it's amazing, it's really inspiring. I work with a lot of families who are making it work in really kind of novel and ingenious ways. And, you know, being really creative with um, kind of using community resources and using different forms of childcare and kind of doing different sorts of work. Um, but I think those two kind of quite practical ones, you know, either my partner doesn't make it work. And then I think in terms of sort of the, the ideological uncertainties around homeschooling, one I get asked a lot is, well, do you have a child um, at level with the system? What happens if they want to go back into the system? Do I need to be following a curriculum to make sure that they're not going to be massively behind if suddenly age 11, they have a burning passion to go into school? And I think linked to that also, there's a lot of uncertainty around um, how does my child do exams or all the rest of their life look like stuff I'm sure which is really um you know I'm sure Wendy has heard lots of this and I'm sure you've heard lots of this too with the work you do um but a, a real sort of uncertainty in but most parents that I work with feel quite confident in home educating their a three-year-old you know not putting them into preschool or home educating their five-year-old but I think when it comes to thinking about okay how do I build up a child educationally who is 11 who is 13 who is nine um I think there's also a lot of insecurity within parents who have sometimes had a really really tough time themselves in the school system feeling well how am I possibly going to be qualified <laughs> in inverted commas to provide my child with a switch education and I think you know we talk a lot in the course that I run around de-schooling and around having a real sort of values-based approach and you know so much of what we've been oh. in this talk comes up in the course as well um but yeah I think there are there are definitely a lot of wobbles I think for people and I can completely understand why because you know like we've kind of touched upon here it's not something that people feel often empowered to do it's not something that um especially if you're coming from you know you have sort of um different factors working against you you know I've worked with single parent families or families where you know their, their wider community culture is really against you know you go to school you do well in school um and I think that it's really you know there is this sense I think that it is sort of you can do it if you're a middle class hippie but anyone else it's not for you and I think it's we toxic it's so toxic isn't it that that narrative yeah, and I hope that, you know, more discussions like this and, you know, I think what all of us here are doing um, will hopefully go to 
slowly change some of that narrative and show that actually home education is for everyone and everyone can do it and you don't need to be qualified you just need to love your kids and books mm. You know, in actual fact, I had this wonderful conversation with Wendy recently um, in which she was saying to me that the, in fact, so often people, parents from disadvantaged backgrounds or perhaps minority backgrounds can be the best people to home educate. And having taught myself, when she said this to me, it made a sort of tingle got my spine because I thought, God, it's so true. No one will ever be as motivated as you to make your child do well. No teacher is gonna care about your child. Um, and, and it's true. And I, and I don't want to run teachers down because we're just we're all just people and lots of pe teachers home educate, but having been a teacher myself, you're concerned about your end of year review and you're concerned about paying your mortgage and the kids come and go. Let's not, let's not turn this into some kind of, uh, you know, idolization of teachers things. They're just people, uh, you, you know, no one will care about your children like you do. And I thought that was a, you know, really powerful point. One simple sentence that seems to get through to parents, trust yourself and trust your child. Just have trust in yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think just quickly, so I think something which I found really invaluable is just trying to have a kind of a list of like non-negotiables. And that is not really for my daughter's education, but that's really things for me because I found that when I'm feeling completely overwhelmed or really anxious or really worried about what's going on, it's just really, really hard to then home educate patiently and to have yeah. grace. So things like, you know, a non, uh, like absolute non-negotiables list, like I need to get outside every day. I need to have like 15 minutes of exercise. I need to be able to take a shower every morning, you know, really mm. small so easy to especially if you have more than one child I think to let that stuff go and then find yourself building with that resentment all day because your basic needs aren't being met yeah. so take care of your own needs first and then the kids will be fine um, a school might be providing you with things to do at home but you don't have to do them if your child is finding it stressful or if you think sitting at a desk for six hours all day is not healthy for them you don't have to do it and uh, your child won't miss out that much. The second tip is that you don't have to stick to a nine to three timetable either. You know, in, in a lockdown period, you're not, you're, you're, the whole timetable has gone out the window, but you know, home educators will, will say that the period around 7.30 at night is a great learning time.